Hello there and welcome back to another video. If you tend to keep up with tech news, and in particular news surrounding streaming and broadcasting technology, you might remember that several months ago, Elgato launched their Stream Deck Studio. The Stream Deck Studio is basically a regular Stream Deck with some much more advanced production studio features which don't really appeal to me, but what does appeal to me is that it is a rack mountable Stream Deck. I've always thought that having a Stream Deck would be cool for the sake of having a panel of programmable buttons that I can use to set up all kinds of different macros. However, the form factor of the regular Stream Decks just doesn't really work with how little free desk space I have on my desk. The biggest contributor to the lack of desk space that I have is my small, custom-built 4U rack that sits front and center on my desk and holds three pieces of audio gear with an extra 1U sitting free. And although this rack is the reason that I can't really use a normal Stream Deck, it's also the exact reason that I think the Stream Deck Studio is so cool. It's because I could get one and put it in my desktop rack. Sounds awesome then. So I'll just head to Elgato's website and order one and... Oh, never mind. It's $900. So today, I'm going to be building my own rack mountable macro button solution. Is it going to be anything close to the power and quality of the real Stream Deck Studio? No. Is the software going to be anywhere close to as good? No. It's actually all going to be hard coded into the Arduino I'll use, so technically there won't even be a software for it that runs on the computer. However, it will be rack mountable. It will have several programmable keys, some knobs, some screens, and when combined with the right programming expertise, it will be capable of being awesome. Plus, it should cost way less than $900 to build. But in any case, this means that it's time to get to work designing this thing. And so, that's what I did. I started out with the design of the case for it, because the mechanical construction of this is really important. I want it to be nice and sturdy, and that somewhat rules out the possibility of 3D printing it. This is because very few 3D printers, and especially not mine, have the ability to print something that's 19 inches wide, meaning that it would have to be in multiple pieces. And when doing that with 3D printed parts, you almost always compromise the build quality. But that's when it came to me. I could use one of the services offered by the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay, to manufacture a high quality sheet metal case for this project. PCBWay is a company that offers high quality manufacturing services at very reasonable prices. They offer a myriad of different services, but some of their main ones are 3D printing with several different processes and materials, 3-axis and 5-axis CNC machining of, again, many different materials, of course versatile PCB production and assembly, and sheet metal production. I've used PCBWay services for tons of previous projects, and not once have I been disappointed in the quality that I've received from them. Check them out at the link in the video description. In any case, I chose to use their sheet metal manufacturing service to create the case for this project, as I thought that would be the most suitable way to get the case the way I wanted it. So, I started designing the case in Autodesk Fusion using its included sheet metal tools, which I had no idea how to use by the way, meaning that I was pretty much just winging it throughout this whole design process, but I eventually came out with a case that looked really promising. It should be the correct dimensions to take up one U of rack space in a standard 19 inch rack, and it has spots for 32 individual macro keys, two potentiometers, and two OLED displays. At the back, it has an interchangeable spot for installing different kinds of USB connectors, and finally, I think it also looks pretty sweet. With the case's model done, there's still a bit more to figure out before I can start building this device. In particular, I need a PCB to hold all of the keyboard switches that I'm using for the programmable buttons into place, as well as to wire up their pull-down resistors. So, I started designing that as well. Designing the PCB to fit the enclosure was minorly challenging, but in the end, it worked out just fine. The PCB has mounting spots for all 32 keyboard switches, as well as 32 spots for pull-down resistors for the switches. The switches aren't wired in a button matrix setup, which may have been a little dumb in hindsight, but I figured that since I've decided to use an Arduino Do, I could just wire them all individually because I have enough input pins. Either way, the PCB also has headers for two potentiometers and two I2C OLED displays, and all of these connections are wired up to the two 20-pin headers that connect the PCB to the Arduino with wires. With both the PCB and the outdoor enclosure done, as well as some small parts for mounting things that could be 3D printed, I sent the designs off to PCBWay to have the enclosure and PCB manufactured. 
I chose to 3D print the 3D printed parts myself, however, if I didn't have a printer, I could have used PCBWay to do that too. Usually I don't mention anything about the ordering process with PCBWay because it's super straightforward, however today I do want to mention something with the ordering process because it's even more straightforward than you might expect. I didn't have to create any kind of engineering drawings for my sheet metal designs or any kind of flat plan, which was really good because I don't know how to do either of those things, and instead I just had to make my 3D model export it as a .step file, and upload it. That was it. It was so awesomely simple. But anyway, a couple weeks later, the parts arrived, and they were beautiful. I had ordered the outer case in 2.5mm thick aluminum with a bead blast and anodized blue finish. To say that I was pleased with how the parts came out would be an understatement. The blue looks awesome, and PCBWay did a great job at hiding the rack marks in the anodized finish, which they explain on their website are just a fact of life when anodizing. The PCBs also came out great, as they always do, and I got right to work soldering one of them up. When soldering one of these boards, if you're choosing to build this yourself, as I will have a full written tutorial in the video description if you want, it's really important to solder the resistors onto the back of the board first, otherwise you won't be able to access their solder pads once the keyboard switches are installed. After the resistors were soldered, I took this time to solder all of the male headers to the board, including the ones for the potentiometers, displays, and the two main headers that connect everything back to the Arduino. With all of that done, I started to solder the switches. Sadly, since the Gatoron Red keyboard switches that I'm using don't snap into the PCB nicely, I had to solder only a few switches at a time so that I could hold them in while soldering. Additionally, they didn't always go in perfectly straight due to how loose the holes were in the package that I used for the keyboard switches, so I'd solder one leg of each switch, and then reflow it while straightening the switch out with a finger before soldering the other leg. It was a bit tedious, but in the end, I had 32 switches and 32 resistors soldered to the board perfectly. With the board prepped, it was still time to prep a couple more components before I could start mounting everything else into the case. I started with the potentiometers, whose legs I trimmed, and then I soldered some female jumper cables to the now more compact contacts on both of them. Then, I took the two OLED displays that I'm going to be mounting in the enclosure as well, and soldered wires to them in a very similar way to how I did the potentiometers. However, since there are two displays in this device and they both run on the I2C bus, I'll need to take the time to change the address of one of them from the default. This is so that they'll be separately addressable in the code. On the backs of these display modules, there's a set of three pads and a small SMD resistor. When the SMD resistor connects the center and right pads, the address is set to a certain value, and when the resistor connects the center and left pads, the address will be set to a different value. Both of the displays came with the resistors on the center and right pads, and so, I took one of the two displays and moved the resistor to connect to the center and the left pad. Later, when running an I2C scanner code, I could see that there were two devices showing up with two different addresses, meaning that using the resistor to change the I2C address worked perfectly. With everything prepped to be put inside the aluminum case, I had to pause for a second to do one more thing, tap some of the holes in the aluminum case. PCBWay can tap holes for you if you specify them, but I just chose to do this myself because I have the tap needed. The only tap needed is a standard M3 tap, which will allow me to mount the Arduino to the bottom of the case with some M3 screws, and to close the case with some more M3 screws. After a while in the garage, I had all of the holes that needed to be tapped, tapped. Then, using 7 M3 by 20 bolts and nuts, as well as 3 small 3D printed spacers that allowed some of the screws to mount without interfering with the resistors on the board, I was able to mount the main PCB to the case. If you're building this yourself, take caution during this part, because if you tighten the screws on the ends of the PCB too much, you can bend the board quite significantly. A small bit of flex is fine to keep the switches pressed against the front panel, but just don't go too hard with it. Then, the potentiometers can be mounted to the case using their included nuts and washers, and knobs can be pressed onto them once mounted. As for the displays, each display needs 4 M2 by 12 screws and nuts, and like with the main PCB, don't crank these screws down or this time, you risk possibly cracking the display. The potentiometers and displays can be hooked up to their headers on the main PCB, and you can reference the schematic to make sure you get all of the connections the right way around. Then, I grabbed the Arduino Do that I'm using for this project because of its versatile I.O. and support of HID, and using the 3D printed mounting tray that I made for it, I mounted it to the case. 
I mounted the 3D printed tray to the case with four M3x6 screws, and then I mounted the Arduino to the tray with some more M3x6 screws. Lastly, it's time for the USB port. The Arduino Duo has micro USB ports on it, which I could have technically made accessible from the back of the enclosure, but I would have had to rotate the Arduino and deepen the case, which would have meant it would be more expensive. So instead, I found these small adapters on Amazon that convert a male micro USB to a female USB-C, and I designed and 3D printed this small holder that the USB-C end can slip into. Then, this can be mounted in the case with some more M3 bolts and nuts. When installing the lid on the enclosure, you'll just have to plug the micro USB end into the correct port on the Arduino, and now there's a nice USB-C port on the back of the device for connecting to a computer. As for the correct port on the Do, you want to plug it into the native USB port, not the programming one, as the programming one doesn't support working as an HID device, which is required for keyboard functionality. Of course, if I was to close the device up right now, it still wouldn't work. The true final part of the hardware for this project is the wiring between the main PCB in the front of the chassis and the Arduino Do. I chose to go the route of manufacturing my entire own custom wiring harness for this device because I didn't have enough female to male jumper wires on hand. However, this was a very big mistake, and it took about four hours of super tedious work to make this monstrosity, which does work just fine, but was again, painful to manufacture. Just buy and use some male to female jumper wires to connect the front PCB to the Arduino if you're gonna do this yourself. After closing up the case, which went pretty much perfectly except for the fact that my tolerances were slightly wrong for one of the three holes on each side, but really that doesn't matter that much, I tested both of the OLED displays. They both worked all right, and both of the potentiometers worked as well, although there was a bit of noise in their readings, and I think this is due to how long the wires they're connected to are, which really isn't ideal, but it's probably manageable. I also made a quick sketch that told me all of the switches were working and were wired to the correct pins, and then with the addition of some simple 3D printed keycaps, the hardware side of the device was done. So I put it into my desktop rack, plugged it into my computer, and started programming. I'm not really going to focus too much on the programming of this device in this video, because the goal here was really to create this really nice piece of hardware and to make that available, so that other people who are better at programming than me can make it work really well. However, I did write some basic code that allows all the buttons to work as simple macro keys, and I've used the displays for what I call a macro preview function. Because the buttons on mine aren't like the Stream Decks with their built-in LCD displays for labeling, it could be easy to lose track of what each button does over time without labeling them, and sometimes labels look ugly. So I dedicated switch 32 to being the preview function. If I hold this button and press any other macro button, the displays will display a basic description of what that button does, and the macro won't be executed until you let go of the preview button and press the macro key again. Hopefully at some point, I'll figure out how to display something like weather information on the displays, or maybe some other information from one of my applications that I use that might be useful. Additionally, maybe I could implement the knobs to control something like volume and screen brightness. However, I am far from having the software for this project fully developed, and I'm planning to develop this part of the project continually as I use it. So for now, I think that this is a super cool device that once combined with mature software will be incredibly awesome to have available on my desk for shortcuts for things like my audio software, video editing software, and CAD software. Finally, remember that there is a tutorial in the description if you find this cool and want to build it. And if it wasn't clear already, the tutorial is just going to be for the hardware. But with all that said, that's all that I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.